everyone, I'm your host, Brittany Jones Cooper, and welcome back to Build. The Broadway musical Hades Town intertwines two mythic tales that take audience members on a hell-raising journey to the underworld and back. Please help me welcome Amber Gray and Patrick Page, who play Persephone and Hades in Hades Town. Guys, I have to tell you, we don't always have an audience this big and this enthusiastic here at Build. I mean, Hades Town has been just a show that people keep talking about. It's been so well received, and obviously, with 14 nominations from the Tonys, it's a pretty huge, huge show. So, what has it been like this journey for you guys? Because I know you guys have been a part of it way before it was on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Amber, the longest. Yeah. Yeah, I did three workshops before the first production, and this is our fourth production together. Um, yeah, and the audiences have changed quite a bit, but I love that people are reacting this way in the final round. You couldn't ask for anything better. Yeah. And what does the Tony nomination feel like? Because you guys have both been nominated individually as well as the show for Best Musical, Best Director. I mean, mm -hmm. it's all across the board. You like us. You really like us. I do. <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? I mean, it, it's great to have uh, a community gather around work you're doing. I, I think Amber... I think you said something in an article I read the other day or something, which was exactly how I feel, which is, I love the piece. Mm -hmm. I've loved it for over three years. That's why I've hung on so uh, vociferously to try to stay a part of it. And so, of course, I love it that other people share my opinion about the work. Um, it's the kind of thing I would like to see if I was going to the theater. It's the kind of thing I like celebrated. It's the kind of thing I want to see more of on Broadway. Uh, and so uh, the Tonys are, are a way of, of people saying, yes, we agree with you. I agree with your opinion. I, I share your taste, and that feels good. Mm -hmm. So for those who are not familiar with Hades Town, who wants to take kind of breaking down the plot? Because I don't want to say because I don't want to give anything away. Well, it comes from a very, very ancient myth, so you're not, it's, you know, it's not really a spoiler. <laughs> However... <laughs> That's fair. Good point, Patrick. <laughs> However, what I do say about it is imagine that you went into uh, a music hall somewhere in New Orleans, maybe in the Dust Bowl era or during the Great Depression, and in this uh, old, perhaps abandoned at times, music hall is this astonishing group of people, each one more interesting, more unique, and sexier than the last. And then this mysterious man walks in and begins to sing a story and the room comes to life and the story is thousands of years old. But it's told in a way that's absolutely modern and hip and now. Um, and it's a love story and it's two intertwining love stories. One of an ancient love and that's Amber and myself, Hades and Persephone and of a brand new Love, which is uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, played by Reeve Carney and Eva Nobozada. And uh, through song, almost exclusively through song, and through poetry, um, this ancient, tragic, and yet ultimately hopeful story unravels and, and you you just kind of become hypnotized by it. I see that happen with the audience. I see, as we begin to do the opening number, people surrendering and just going into this world. But you really have, it's like you've left New York City and you're now in a different place. Well, I think that's because when Andre walks out, I've never seen a show start in that way. And you are immediately snapped into like, what the hell is this? What is happening? This is so special. So for you guys on stage, can you see the audience sort of have that moment like, yeah, you see them sit forward quite physically. And also that ritual is for us on stage as well. It's for the audience, but it's also for us to get on board. I always equate it to like the yoga class you don't feel like doing. You're like, here it goes. It's starting anyway. And you have to get through the next 90 minutes, you know? When he says all right to us, that we are earnestly, when we say it back, all right. <laughs> and then the music takes you, and the music really sustains you for the whole show, even when you have a case of the I don't want us, is what I call it, when you're like really tired or ill or, you know, whatever it is, five minutes deep, you've forgotten all of that, and you're on the ride. It's awesome. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it, that in the opening number, the, the, he's warning you, you know, Andre's warning mm. you. He's saying the very first thing he says is, this is gonna, it's going it's to, it's a sad story, right? It's not going to end well. But the trombone is contradicting him. The trombone is joyful at the same time. So you've got these two things pulling in opposite directions. And um, 
I just think that's that's wonderful about it. And you feel that balance really throughout the entire musical where there's the darkness, right? We're talking about Hades Town, but there's also this beautiful, like, lyrical music, and it's so light at the same time that you do forget it is a tragedy until you realize it is a tragedy. Um, let's talk about Persephone. Um, you bring her to life in such a... Uh, it's just, like, such a fun and joy to watch you on that stage. Thank you. Um, so take me through the process of developing her, because you've been with her for a while. Yeah, she's gone through many phases, like outside in as well. Um, been in four different costumes, all chartreuse green. <laughs> Not sure why. Um, but, you know, like a simple example I say to a lot of people is that Persephone didn't really start drinking and self-numbing and self-medicating until London. So I did two productions before that, and then suddenly Chafkin started talking about Ab Fab all the time. And I like, I, pop culture references are always lost on me because I never grew up with the television. I'm like, what's Ab Fab? And then I went down a great rabbit hole of absolutely fabulous. Sweetie, darling, I love it. An amazing <laughs> thing to be exposed to. Um, yeah, but that is like a really easy change to talk about. Um, but that mainly comes from the fact that in these last two iterations, Persephone is complicit in the story and sort of the ugliness that Hades Town has become. I know it, but I'm ignoring it and blocking it. But that didn't come until these final two productions. So she's changed greatly. And that's just like a really easy example to and get. Your singing voice too. There's like this grit or growl. Mm. Is that something that you have naturally, or something that you kind of pull out even more for her? I pull it out even more for her. And I've also told people the first production we did, Our Lady of the Underground, was an entre act. So it wasn't. It was the start of Act Two, more in a cabaret style to warm the audience back up again. It wasn't particularly part of the plot. So because of that circumstance, I was able to play around with my voice in a way that I probably wouldn't have if it had been part of the plot. And then from there, in further later iterations, I've just exaggerated that and, and gone with it and pulled that into other numbers as well. Yeah. But I don't think I would have instinctively started singing that way <laughs> if it hadn't been an entre act originally. Yeah. Speaking of voices, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. That is a bass. Uh, so uh, take me through your casting process and because, I mean, I could not imagine another voice singing this Hades voice. Well, Amber's done it with a, a few other Hades and she's done it, uh, I think, with a tenor and with a baritone. Yes, and the role yes. can be played in those ways. Um, I think when, when I first met Aeneas, uh, the only thing I had heard is that they were perhaps looking for a true bass. I think they weren't entirely sure. So I came and I said, oh, I can sing it this way or I can sing it up an octave from here. And we did it both ways. She said, no, 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 sing it down there. And that, I think, was a, a good decision on her part because in, from, from my ear, at least, it does, a lot of the, it does a lot of the character work for you, right? In other words, you're play, people say, well, how do you play a god? I said, well, she wrote it there. Right, because that's not a that's not a human sounding voice. Um, that's a subterranean voice that you think, oh, that's maybe what the Lord of the Underworld sounds like. In the same way, that Reeve Carney's voice when he's singing these ridiculous falsetto notes, ridiculously beautiful, but ridiculous to write. Um, uh, again, that's that's a, that's an ethereal sound that's not quite of this world. That's above this world. So she's written above this world and she's written below this world. And uh, I joke with Aeneas to say, I think she might be unique among Broadway songwriters, at least, in that I believe she's the only uh, composer who composes on the guitar as opposed to on the piano. Now, if you were composing on the piano, you would look and you would look down at the bottom of the keyboard there and you'd see that you were on the very last G that was possible. And you'd say, oh, you'd no, no, away I, from I, it. I mustn't do that. That's crazy. Right. Similarly, you'd see that this note is way up here and, and you'd say, I mustn't do that. That's crazy. But because she's on the guitar, she's just writing what she hears in her head. Um, so, yeah, that's been a joy for me to be able to use that that part of my instrument, which so rarely gets used in, in terms of being in terms of singing, at least. One of the muses has uh, a really low, yeah. deep alto voice as well, too, and I love hearing a woman sing that low. Yeah. Yeah. It is so gorgeous. beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that's Jewel. Yes, yeah. yeah, she's so amazing. Uh, what kind of work did you guys do together um, to harmonize and get that right? Was that work for you to try to match that that bass? 
Yeah, we had to sing, in early days, we sang How Long, our sort of main duet that we sing, get to sing together. We sang it in a few different keys till we found what sounded in the pocket for both of us. And that took a while. Um, and then I was never able to listen to the concept album for like a year. It couldn't, it really messed with me. Um, but in talking about those extremes for the men, it is really wonderful to have a woman write music for other women because she writes in the pocket of our voices. It's really juicy. And then we can do things like exaggerate the sounds and the noises we're making. Uh, Cause when, you know, it's just the, we don't understand the other's instrument. You know, when a man is writing for a woman, a lot of times they end up singing in the rafters the whole time, which is like cool when you can do it. But and after a while, a, the ear doesn't even want to hear that the whole time. You know, And then they need a standby two times a week because you can't do that eight times Correct. a week, right? But also you just don't want to hear that the whole time. Amber Gray doesn't. Um, uh, so yes, for, for the ladies as well, it is quite a treat to have a woman composing that music. Yeah. Is there a moment in the show, a song in the show that you guys always look forward to, whether you're performing it or not, but just sort of your kind of moment in the show that you think is just very special to you? I love Flowers. It's my favorite mm -hmm. part of the show. And I've seen a few, between all the workshops and the productions, I've seen a few different women sing it over the years. And I've seen, I've seen Aeneas sing it in concert. Um, it's a gorgeous song to navigate, physically the singing of it, the emotion of it. I just like never get tired of it and look forward to that every night. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, to me, the, 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 the Hades Town is almost like a song. Mm. Um, in, in fact, he even says that at the beginning of the show, Hermes says it's a sad song, but we're gonna sing it again as if the whole thing is one song. It's very difficult for me to take it apart into pieces and say I like this bit better than that bit. Um, I have a weird experience when I listen to it, which is that I almost always have to listen to it through. Um, and uh, so it's really, it, it's really very, that would be very, very hard for me to put my finger on. Um, it's, it's the only album I have of, of kind of musical theater type albums where I don't skip any songs. Normally there's just that song you just, you know, yeah. you know, shapoopy, no way. <laughs> I, 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 you know, <laughs> um, but uh, not in Town. I agree, I like all the songs too, so that's yeah. actually a great answer. Yeah. Um, you, you guys mentioned that this is a tragedy and I think in these current political times, there are themes in the musical that, you know, this was written far before tw the 2016 election, mm -hmm. but now I don't know if I'm projecting or if it's just something that's come to life since 2016 with the play, but there are some political themes in it. Um, so what is your connection with that? What kind of conversations have you guys had as far as songs like Build the Wall? Has the meaning of that changed since the election or is it still something that is open up to interpretation for the audience? Well, when I first heard that song, of course, Donald Trump was still a game show host pretending to be a billionaire. <laughs> So it, it, it didn't even cross my mind that it had anything to do with our southern border or anything like that. Um, and, and the song, I, I, what I fear for the song is that the, the, the astonishing metaphor that she's written gets lost in people's literal thinking. I hope that doesn't happen. Because of course we're not talking about a, a wall like that. Um, and yet, uh, despots and autocrats from the beginning of time have used the symbol of the wall as a way of trying to divide people, uh, divide and conquer, you know, as Hermes says, um, and trying to frighten people, because when you divide people and frighten them, you can control them. So, uh, yes, it has changed, and, and it changes depending on where we do it, right? When I first sang the song, at least, uh, we were downtown New York Theater Workshop, and although Donald Trump had come down the escalator and begun his uh, routine, um, it, was, uh, it was still a bit of a joke, right? We, none of us really believed this is gonna happen. Um, then he was elected, and the next production we did was in Canada. So now, it's Americans from the South speaking to Americans from the North, and they're seeing it differently because we, we're, we're dealing with this issue down where we are. Then 
we go over to London and we sing the song there. And um, they're dealing with their own kind of wall, right, with Brexit. Um, and now singing it in the Walter Kerr, where in the Walter Kerr Theater, if you haven't seen the show yet there, I can see virtually every member of the audience during that song, the way it's lit. Um, it's a, quite an intimate theater. And people, a lot, some people are crying. Some people are just gobsmacked. Some people laugh. But I think they laugh in a very uncomfortable way. Um, I think either way you can't, <clears throat> excuse me, run away from it now in a way that you were maybe able to in 2016 when we sang it at New York Theater Workshop. Uh, there's a reason that song poured out of Aeneas in 10 minutes and very few words have ever been changed from that initial sort of oracle moment, you know? Um, the sad reality is there's always been fascism and there always will be, but people are unable to run away, United States Americans are unable to run away from the song right now in a way that we used to be able to. And occasionally, you will have the person in the audience who um, is a supporter of the current administration mm. and will be upset by that and will get up and leave during the song. And I feel like I want to shout after them, I'm not singing about your boy. Like this was yeah. written in like 2010 yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, it's like this has nothing to do with that yeah, guy. Yeah, 2006. 2006, yeah. wow, yeah. even further back. Yeah. Yeah, that's phenomenal. She's like a prophet. I think mm -hmm. it's an oracle. Yeah. Because there's even the themes of global warming in, in the musical as mm -hmm. well. It just really seems to be kind of on the pulse. Yes. Really yes. And, and and the economic <laughs> yeah. of the, the the whole economics of Hades Town. Yep. Uh, Sweatshop labor. Yeah. 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 And and you know, when you were talking about um uh, Persephone self medicating more. It was making me think everyone in Hades Town is anesthetized to a mm. great degree. They don't remember who they are, their eyes don't see anymore. Um, and that is something that happens to people who surrender their souls to uh, consumerism, to uh, which, which isn't to say you can't participate in capitalism and be alive, but it is to say you can die by participating in capitalism mm -hmm. and not knowing what you're doing. Yeah. I do like, even though there are those heavy themes and without giving anything away, there is this feeling at the end that, you know, as a human race, we can try again or persist or take another shot at it, kind yeah. of. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be so tragic, even though it is sort of tragic. Yes, and the thing about, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm definitely coming down with a cold. It's a horrible timing. Um, you need to stop talking to me no, to no, save your voice good. for the show. I good. understand. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if I just sat here. Um, <clears throat> the thing about activism, I've been in political activist group for 15 years. The goal is never that you're going to succeed even in your generation. The goal is just nudging the needle so that the next Orpheus who goes down like maybe won't turn around. And probably you're going to have like 20 who do for a while. You know, It's just about making the possibility be there, which is quite hopeful possibility is more than you had before so yeah I, I do think it ends on a very positive note but it is activism is not fun work it's thankless yeah on that note um how fun is the ending of this musical for you guys with the audience reaction to that moment and I'm trying to be as vague as possible but you know what I'm talking about well that moment is the part that is true to the myth so there's no spoiler I know but I always feel um, it. most of you guys have seen it anyway you know what I'm talking uh -huh, about uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I I'm no longer on, st in other iterations, I've been on stage for it, and we aren't anymore, and I am, dramaturgically, I should not be there, but um, selfishly as an actor, I like, really wish I was there to hear those sounds that the audience makes. Every now and then the sound will make it to the basement where I am, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, to be honest, I'm not there. What we do see is during the curtain call, I see, you know, grown men that look like firefighters, you know, with, with tears streaming down their face. Um, so I know that that moment and the, and the totality of the event is, is reaching people in a way that's really, really satisfying. I think it's that and then also at the end the lights come up and you guys sing to us. And I thought that was a really unique and special moment. And I also feel like that sort of pushed people even further into their emotions, just sort of having that vulnerability with you guys. So what is that like for you guys at the end of the night to sort of just, because it feels like that's the moment where you've just sort of left it all out there. Yeah, well, that's Amber's song, so I'll let her speak to it. Yeah. But I will say that it, it's, um, 
I don't know of another show where that occurs, mm -hmm. where the, the the essential storytelling is done, the curtain call is done, and yet there's still something more. Um, and because it's uh, unique to Hades Town, um, the audience has been surprised by it in the past, and it's taken Rachel and the team and Amber a lot of work to get it to land in just the right way, so it feels right. We've tried times without that song, um, and. It, and the show ends great, and the audience goes out happy, but then it never felt right. So, I mean, I'll let Amber speak to it, because it's really her number. That's funny. I very much so do not think of it as my number. Um, yeah, even tonally, the notes of the song, it's like a band, it's, it's the mending moment, I think. And when you don't have it, I just think the wound is left open. Um, because even if you're not paying attention to the words, then the poetry is quite beautiful in that final number. But again, it's about the hope message of thanking the person that tried, failed, but tried. And you know, the roots of Greek tragedy are um, religious, right? Mm. Um, the actors were high priests, they would don masks, and it was taken very seriously in a religious sense. And to me, uh, Andre is an extraordinarily spiritual man, I think. He carries what I admire about him so much is, and I, he, he might contradict me now, or I hope he wouldn't, but I think, I think so many of us are afraid of our own innate divinity, and he isn't. And so he walks on the stage with that authority, and he begins it, and you get the sense that you're going to be taken to a spiritual place. Now, I grew up Catholic. That song at the end is very much like the end of a Catholic mass, where everything's done, the Eucharist is done, and yet there's one final blessing. And I think that exists in most religious traditions. But it feels very right to me from where, for where I come from. I think I'm going to call it his divine swag. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna, yeah, because yeah. I was before I was just calling it his swag, but I like the divine swag. Uh, we do have a couple of questions yeah. for the audience before we get out of here. Who do we have first? Hi there. First of all, uh, the two of you and the whole show are just so incredible. So thank you so much for bringing it back to New York. Thank you. Uh, my question for whoever wants to tackle it is from New York Theater Workshop to now, how would you say your onstage relationship has evolved in contrast to the Orpheus Eurydice relationship? Hmm. Well, their relationship has changed a lot. Yeah. Um, because that character has, and, and, and Reeve Carney has done an astonishing job, I think because he's had to take that character almost 180 degrees from where it started, right? It started as kind of this swaggering, uh, um, James Dean-like uh, character, and now he's this naive, uh, simple, but brilliant artist. Um, and I, I really stand in awe of his ability to do that and to not freak out you know, the stakes are real high. He's opening a show on Broadway, and the creators are saying, come with us here. We're going to change everything about what you do. So bravo to him. Um, and the addition of Eva Novozada, who is a real ballsy young woman, fiery, articulate, um, opinionated, that has that has sharpened Eurydice in a way. So the contrast between those two things, pulling those poles farther apart, has made that very interesting. For our relationship, I think Amber and I have spoken before about the fact that it's, it's been just a, a, a continuing level of comfort with each other um, that's allowed us, to, I, and, I, and again, I think it's like pulling the poles farther apart. Your self-medication's gotten more. I think Hades' insecurity has gotten more. As I've understood more and more how everything he does is driven by his fear. Um, I don't know, what do you think? I don't think the Orpheus Eurydice story is what has clarified ours or changed ours over time. If anything, it's the addition of the workers' chorus that has really affected ours. Um, Again, because in the in these later versions, I'm complicit in what it has become. And Orpheus coming down there helps me wake up to what we've done, and then I get to help him wake up. And you know, the story goes on from there. But 
that is sort of the biggest change in our relationship over the years. But the roots of ours have, for the most part, remained the same more than anybody else's material. Because she got it right the first time. <laughs> um, Nailed it. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yeah. Mm. Next question. Hi, Patrick and Amber. Thank Hi. you for being here. Um, as a pit musician, it's really, really nice to see the incorporation and involvement of how the pit involves with the cast on stage during Hades Town. Mm. I want to know what it's like interacting with them every single night on such an intimate level. Like, yeah, I mean, there's a reason all twenty of us come out at the same time. Like when Rachel speaks to us, she often speaks to us as the twenty of us as a unit. You know, there are the seven uh, musicians, and then there are the thirteen actors. Um, but we think of ourselves as one band, and that's why they respond to Andre as well when he says, all right, sort of as Andre, not as Hermes yet, you know? Um, it's a fine line in the beginning, that first number, as we take on those roles. We come out as a company just to tell a story, and the musicians are part of that. And there are several of those musicians we're super attached to, like in particular the trombone player, Brian Dry. He has amazing subs, but like, you, the first note that's played, we know a sub is on before we go out there, but you can close your eyes and just be like, that's not Brian Dry. It's like, we, they just feel different. And we made those things with those seven musicians since New York Theater Workshop, you know? We've been with other ones in other iterations, but yeah. Yeah, and Rachel has said, you know, and, and Liam Robinson, our, our musical director, has said, we're, we're all musicians. In a way, we're all musicians first mm -hmm. as storytellers in this. Mm -hmm. It's a sung through musical, and we're musicians, and we're going to tell this story through song. Thank you. Next one. Hi, thank you Hi. for being here. Um, I'm sorry you're sick because my question was That's for okay. you. Um, your facial expressions uh -huh. are just brilliant. Thanks. They need a Tony in itself. Yes. So my question to you. They have a Tony for that actually. Uh. <laughs> my question to you is um, how much of that is actually you and how much of that is stage direction? Like I know during your scene when you just fall over and the hair just goes uh -huh. and the body and just every, you, it's, you're so mesmerizing on Thank stage. You. It's hard to keep, to look away from you. I have no idea what my face does and I hate watching feedback of the show because then it makes me really, I'm like, I look like a monster. Um, a lot of the, the way David Newman works is really incredible because they just give you a lot of prompts. And same with Rachel Chafkin. In early days when we were fizzing out the, figuring out the physicality, David was choreographing another show at the same time. So half the time it was just Rachel and I in a room or whatever. But that particular moment you're talking about falling over was a prompt from Rachel to just like uh, exorcise demons before <laughs> the second line where I have to go back down to Hades Town. So that's where that came from. And then I thought, came out of my weird imagination accepting that prompt, you know? And then D David Newman came back and saw it and cleaned up some things, you know? So it's like a real collaboration in that way. And a lot of my movements for Persephone over time have come from, <laughs> I was so honored that I got a Gina Rivera nomination that I was like, you think I can dance? <laughs> it's amazing. I love telling stories with my body and I love movement, you know? And I, I feel like I'm a good mover, but I don't, if you say dance terms to me, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but that movement has come from just how I want to move to that music. That music really does make you want to move, you know? So that's what I got. Those are my, those are ambergris. <laughs> Moves a lot of the time. And then they get cleaned up by other people. Yeah, and sometimes specific direction comes in, but it's a, it's a real combo. Even when you just smile up here, you do that. And I was like, oh, that's, a, that's the same <laughs> smile. It's so I got excited too, I'm with you. It's like, keep Love smiling, it. it's great. great. Uh, next question. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, one of the changes that I noticed right away when I saw it on Broadway from New York Theatre Workshop is in Chant 2, Persephone had a whole verse about her relationship and the origin. And she of did for about 10 previews here, too. And then it got cut. That was in my contract. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering about yeah. what the, if you, un, if you know and can tell us what the creative reason was for Efficiency. Cutting. We needed to cut many moments in the play, to be totally honest with you. We need to get the time down. And that particular moment, it wasn't so much about the relationship anymore. It was, and nor did it need to be, because that was totally redundant at that point. Um, what it had come about was some advice to Eurydice that we just like no longer needed in that moment. 
And musically, Aeneas, it, it's so full now with the workers' chorus that musically it felt like a weird sort of, um, not bridge, I don't know the actual technical term of the music language, but it was like an extra addition that did not need to be there for the structure of the song itself anymore. Um, yeah. There you yeah go. That was a cool part of that song, though. It was. And, uh, and you can always still hear it on the uh, Off-Broadway Live album because I, I always loved playing yeah. that scene because it was this, like, it was like a, almost like a bullfight. Yeah. I don't know who the bull and who the matador was. It changed. But it was, uh, yeah, it changed. But between Persephone and Hades. But, you know, as Amber was saying, the stories moved on at that point. It was how long is the confrontation between mm -hmm. Hades and Persephone, and now it's moved on to the confrontation between Hades and Orpheus, and it's got to go from there into right. epic. So, and I know that one that will live forever on the Off Broadway cast album. That's one of ten verses that I know that are wildly different that don't repeat lines. You know, so one day I'll make my own little album. <laughs> <laughs> On the topic of albums, you guys did a new cast album, correct? And that's coming out, I think, June 7th? Mm -hmm. um, so how fun was that to get in the studio? Or do you do, the, do it in the studio, right? I'm assuming, right? Okay. Yeah. It yeah, we, down, like, we laid it down really dirty. fast, you yeah. know, because... Uh, because you have a cast that sings this material eight times a week, you don't have to do a hundred takes of everything. We did a couple of takes of everything, and uh, and now they're engineering it, and it'll come out soon. Yeah, that's exciting. And I think we have another question. No, that's it. Well, I, I have so many more questions myself, but I'll <laughs> let you guys go because I know you have a show thank to do. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining us. Hades Town for me was such a ride. It was such a joy. There's messaging in there that I was talking about with my friends for hours afterwards, and I think a lot of people are going to leave having these same conversations. So congratulations on Hades Town. Thank and you. And you can catch Hades Town at the Walter Kurt Theater and visit hadestown.com for ticket information. Please put your hands together for Amber Gray and Patrick Bage. Thank you.